thank you so much that you will yeah, allow us to have a look into your career, into your <laughs> thoughts about AI, into your heart maybe even about AI, because you have been personally involved a lot with artificial intelligence. And so we have heard a lot already, and I want to start with a more personal question. Um, Charlie, you have had a long career in computer science and in the internet. Um, could you give us a big picture overview of the creation and development of the internet um, over the last 50 years. La yesterday you told about artificial intelligence. What about the internet? How did it start? Um, and what would be five milestones maybe on the internet? Um, sure, maybe I'll answer uh, a little bit more broadly than just the internet, but that's certainly a, a thread that runs through. Um, I was thinking about this you know, past 50 years, and I'm not old enough to be involved in stuff 50 years ago, but I've been around for almost 40. Um, and, and what were the key, in my perspective, what were the key breakthroughs technologically that we saw? Uh, two that were before my time. Um, uh, one was just the microprocessor, that we were able to squeeze a computer processor onto an integrated chip. Uh, and, and that sort of set off this um, this growth in computing power that's, um, that's been up until maybe 10 years ago, doubling every 18 months or so. And, and the second that was somewhat before my time, but then I entered early enough to be mentored by some of those who were involved, was the creation of internet technology, which happened in, um, one could argue that some of it happened in the early 60s, but most of it happened in the late 60s and early 70s, the introduction of the ARPANET uh, and um, sending messages around in small packets rather than uh, a, a connection end to end like you like in a phone call. Uh, so then I uh, entered the picture as the internet was um, limited to defense uh, sites and a few universities. And in the mid 80s, we um, created a network to interconnect supercomputer centers. And so I was on the team that put that device in Champaign-Urbana to connect to this network that eventually became nationwide and, and, and evolved into the internet. But when I joined, um, I, I was drawing maps of the internet and, and I could name all of the hosts that were on it um, in 12 point font on a piece of letterhead. So it was very small at that time. And now nobody could even do, do that because we don't know how many computers are, are on the internet. So, so the internet really you know, it, it carries through. Um, in my own career, I think there's another uh, era of, um, of breakthrough for science and eventually for society as we're seeing today, which is high performance computing, and that is a supercomputer. So while microprocessors were being developed, uh, desktop machines and PCs, there was also this parallel thread which was trying to build very, very fast, a thousand times faster than the desktop machines um, with specialized, uh, um, specialized technology. And, and so high performance computing, I would say, is another one of those milestones in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, as the internet was just growing and the applications on the internet were file transfer, remote, remote access to computers, um, supercomputers made this transition in the early 90s as microprocessors got faster and faster. They caught up with the very expensive supercomputer processors. So there was a period of time in the early 90s when the cost of doing big computing was uh, in the late 80s $1,000 per CPU hour on a supercomputer. And then with the introduction of microprocessor-based workstations by 1992 or so, the cost of that much computing went down to 100 and then $10. So that really disrupted the field. And then we had to figure out, since we could no longer keep the companies in business that sold processors for a million dollars each, we had to build computers out of these microprocessors. So the computing field moved from putting their applications on a very expensive computer that had, say, four or eight CPUs to breaking their algorithms and problems up into small chunks and moving them to 
computers uh, like the one I, um, uh, my favorite supercomputer of all time was the Connection Machine 5. It was this eight foot tall black wall with, with LED uh, panels on the sides and, and that had 512 processors. So it felt like a big leap to take your application that ran on one or four processors and break it into 512 chunks. So today we're building machines that have millions of processors. And, and so that switch from small number to large number and breaking our problems up, uh, that was in the 90s when that sort of began. So, and we call that massively parallel processing or MPP. Um, then I think I'm, I'm, I'm at three now, so I have two, four, so I have two more. Don't uh, worry about go. I'm gonna go with six, <laughs> uh, so six. So, so the next one um, uh, was the World Wide Web. And um, when did that start exactly? So, so the World Wide Web, um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee invented this notion, well, even back further. Um, uh, in the 60s, there were several people that were envisioning the notion of um, interconnected text. And in fact, in 1945, Vannevar Bush, who is, uh, his photo is at the National Science Foundation because he's, considered the, sort of the father of the science enterprise in the US. So in 1945, he wrote a paper called the, uh, that, that talked about the Memex. And there's this picture of, the de of a desk with a window, and underneath was all the world's knowledge somehow captured. And, the, and that these, uh, uh, these pieces of information were somehow hyperlinked together. So this kind of vision of the web predates Tim Berners-Lee, but he wrote software while he was at CERN in the late 1980s that would allow anyone uh, to link text together. Um, and uh, then I was at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications and around the early 90s, there were lots of groups around the, around the world that were trying to figure out how to do two things. One, write software so that you could put that software on your computer and host information via web server, which is what we call it today. So that server side was one uh, area where lots of people were, were, were developing technology. The other area was the browser. You know, like now we use Chrome or, or Opera or Internet Explorer. Um, and, and NCSA, we focused on both of those things and um, ended up having the, the uh, fairly good success with both of them. The one that people know the most, if they know any of this, uh, if it's an ancient history to you, uh, is the Mosaic browser. And that was released uh, in, I, I think it was in the spring of 93. And that was a web browser that allowed you to place text and images on the same page. This is a time, at a time when a very low resolution picture would take some time to load on your, on your page. And, and um, so that kind of really took off the other side. We also um, developed the server side, um, something called the Apache server. Um, and, and that also sort of took off. And my role at that time was uh, one of the groups that was in my organization was responsible for the web servers that those Mosaic browsers were programmed to, um, to, to contact when they first started up. And so, when we had 100,000 downloads and then a million downloads over time, our web servers were uh, you know, quite overloaded. So I spent most of my waking hours in the first few years of the, uh, of the explosion of the web working on how do we make sure that we have web servers that can keep up with this, with this sort of load. So then I'd say one more um, important milestone technology, if you will, would be deep learning. And I say that partly because of what I was showing yesterday, that the introduction of deep learning and large enough and complex enough networks to, do, um, to learn from data that hadn't been by hand annotated, um, that introduced uh, some inflection points in capability that, for example, in 2012, um, uh, the state of the art for image recognition was 25% uh, error rate. Human error rate is five, four or five percent. And from 2012, the introduction of deep learning, it went down to 16 or 17 percent. Then the next year, down to eight or nine percent. And and so within three years, with deep learning as an as a new kind of approach to to computer vision, 
And then the other place we, we've seen in the news with deep learning is in the protein folding with um, AlphaFold from, from DeepMind in around 2019, which took something that uh, was a multiple months experimental uh, uh, activity, which is given a, uh, the, the genetic sequence for a protein, how does it look in 3D, how does it fold? And that became now a thing that you could do in, you know, in a few minutes on a, on a computer, so. Yeah. Anyway, so that's like Charlie's view of, of, of a centric view <laughs> and, and of And we the... realize how deeply passionate you are intertwined with that development <laughs> and you are just driving it yourself. Uh, very good. Um, the internet has started as quite an idealistic project, actually, in order to bring people closer and foster freedom of expression and so on. Would you say that this vision of the internet has been fulfilled? I mean, we've seen that technologically everything could be worked out and presented, but what has become, uh, what, what, the, what has the internet actually become? Uh, have the dreams become true or how do you see the current um, state? Some dreams, some nightmares uh, have come true. Um, as I was thinking about this question, um, I think there have been a couple of phases that the internet has gone through. When I first was on the internet in the 80s, um, it was a closed community, and the notion of computer security was really sort of a secondary concern, uh, because it was all your friends, or at least your colleagues, and they're all academia. And then uh, in 1989, um, a graduate student from Cornell wrote this really clever program that would look for openings over the network in ability to get into another computer through things like electronic mail exchange and things like that. So he wrote this really clever program that would transfer itself to another computer and then look for other computers and then move around. But he made a programming error, which was that he, he didn't limit the program to one copy per machine. And so as, as soon as it got into the, your computer, and I had several that it got into, it essentially just exploded like uh, the Star Trek episode about the little furry things, uh, uh, the tribbles that, that filled. So just explode, or the Harry Potter scene where all the things double uh, when you touch them. And so your computer like got clogged up within a few minutes and we were all like scratching our heads and and calling each other because you couldn't email because the computers are down going, what is going on? So we realized that computer security, that was called the, uh, so the guy's name was Morris, it's called the Morris Worm. And, and that was a really a, 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 a wake up call to all of us involved in the internet that security is more than just bad actors, it's also just mistakes that people make. Uh, and so at that point in time, the group that met three times a year, actually at the time they were meeting four times a year around the world that was setting internet standards, made a new rule, which is when you propose an internet protocol, like a new protocol for doing this or that, sending mail, downloading file, whatever, you have to have a, a section in your, in your document that says what are the security implications and risks and what are your risk mitigation strategies. Even if there are none, still have to have the section, but just say there's no. Uh, so, so that was one flip. The other was with the web, we were very excited because now anyone could be a publisher of information. So this is a very democratizing uh, sort of thing. Um, and th that was true, uh, but it was also, it was a meritocracy, if you will. In the, and what I mean is that I could write whatever I want, I could publish it on the web, but in order for you to find that information, it had to be linked from somewhere else. And most likely you'd want to be linked to a search engine. Uh, AltaVista was one, there were some search engines that nobody's ever heard of now. Um, but Google came along and Larry Page and Sergey Brin um, had this really good idea for um, creating a database of the web that would allow you to find things and there's, they invented something called the page rank, which is not page as in web page, but page as in Larry page. And the page rank that they, uh, it was, you get higher ranking in the search results based on the number of other web pages that link to yours. 
So if your web page is popular, then it's going to show up in search results, and that could sort of snowball from there. But just some crazy dude in Montana writing, you know, some manifesto is probably not going to show up in a search engine for quite a long time because um, there's nothing to amplify that that message. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so that, you know, talking about the 1990s and the early 2000s, so all that changed with social networks because now it's no longer a meritocracy in the same sense. Now it's um, a recommender algorithm in a social network that's looking for information that causes people to react and stay on the site longer. And the consequence of that, um, that purely technical uh, system is that now we've, we've learned if we, probably psychiatrists or psychologists knew this for a long time, uh, that if you wanna get people to engage, make them mad. That's how talk radio works, that's how you know, extreme left or right TV works, make people mad. And um, turns out crazy information makes people mad too. And so the, the outcome of these recommender systems has been what we now call the echo chamber, which is I, I like this information about this conspiracy, so I'm gonna get more and more of it. And they work very quickly. Uh, like within a few days of you being on a social network, it's figured out enough about you to start feeding you uh, stuff that will, will, will make you mad. So, so that's not what we envisioned. Um, uh, and, and I think we also didn't envision recommender systems. I don't know how we, we could have, you know, was in the future, so. Um, so that part's been, I'd say, sort of a nightmare, and, and we're still grappling with that. Um, the Supreme Court in the U.S. last week uh, ruled that these platforms are still not um, liable for any information that they promote, uh, which is based on a, a law from the 1990s that was during that other period of time in the Internet. Uh, so we're, 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 um, we're going to face this problem with AI even more uh, so it will amplify the amplification. So it's urgent, I think, for, for uh, our governments to, to, um, to figure it out. And for, I think and also, also urgent for, for social media companies to, to figure out uh, what to do about it. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the point about the money also plays a, a certain role because if you can pay advertisements on your websites will also be, yeah. be there. So I think we still have some problems that were there from the beginning, actually. And so my question would be, this is the internet that has developed 30 years ago or 40 years ago, I mean, about 30 years when it really became public to everyone. And now we are on a new verge, like the artificial intelligence, chat GPT and so on. Is there anything we can learn from the development of the internet and what has maybe not gone in a good direction and how could we use this knowledge in order to prevent the same thing to happen with ChatGPT and other open AI resources uh, that might be available soon? Uh, I, I think there are a couple things we, we can learn and try to apply. There was some attempt um, at, in the social media companies, Facebook as the biggest example, to fact check uh, political advertisements, and then they sort of threw up their hands because of the political pressure from one side or the other that was saying we're being silenced. Um, and and so rather than fix the problem, they 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 gave up. And that's not necessarily anyone's fault. There, every, everyone is uh, share, shares that responsibility. But I think. Uh, with AI, the, the, the power of these algorithms has grown to the point, and the fact that they use language, the fact that these generative AI systems like ChatGPT can create very persuasive text. If you can imagine um, not just persuasive text, but um, stories and images and messages that are not just generally persuasive, but are persuasive for you based on your history. So like combine the recommender system with deep you know, inform, uh, with uh, misinformation, and now you have a personalized disinformation feed that's that's aimed at you. Um, so the lesson for us, uh, I think, uh, since we don't, I don't sit on the Facebook board, so we have very little, you know, uh, that we can 
do as individuals. But I think the lesson for us is to, is to really think about the information that we're getting on the internet. I mean, like we say, this is like kind of a rule of thumb in the internet. Uh, we like to quote Abraham Lincoln, who said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. So that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 that's always been true, and and yet we we we're so susceptible to to um, information. We're designed to take in information that we forget sometimes that the source of that information may not have the same thing in mind that we do. Uh, and so I think that's like the first thing I would say. We we learned that we need to be really skeptical about what we read. Uh, and, and I think another thing which has even struck me in the last couple of weeks is just reading papers about the impact of the uh, social media on youth uh, and the vulnerability that our kids have. And so I think that, uh, you know, I see it. We, we go to restaurants, we see parents who have their kids on tablets, and some of those tablets are just playing games, and that's, you know, between parents and their kids. Some of some of the kids that are like 10 or 11 years old are already on Instagram or on Facebook. And I would tell parents, no, that's like, I let my kid walk down a dark alley in the south side of Chicago, but that might be safer than putting them on, on, on Instagram at age 12 because of the, the way that we develop as people. So um, I think there's lots of, I mean, maybe one way to answer the question would be what should companies do, what should the government do, but I think we have more control over what we do. And so I'd say those are the lessons, like um, remind yourself of a couple of things. One, the source of the information may or may not be trustworthy. Uh, number two, what you're seeing is a small slice of any story. Um, and so seek out other alternative uh, stories. And, and number three, um, renew our commitment to protecting our youth uh, and, and think about this as a, one of the primary areas where we can protect them. Which is easily said, but not easily done, probably. Yeah, because there is the drive. If everyone in the peer group wants to go into the internet or wants to use Instagram or whatever uh, social media, then they want to be part of the group, of course. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, and, and maybe then, although, you know, just warning in a 12-year-old, um, well, you could actually you could say to your 12-year-old, you're not allowed because you're too young and your friends are breaking the law. I think there's a there's an age limit of 13, isn't it? I don't know. Uh, is there an age limit uh, to use? So, some of the sites do have an age limit. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is is to it, let's uh, let's say you have a 15 year old and they're on Instagram all the time is to have conversations with them and say you know when you are watching Charlie's news feed and you're seeing like him posting pictures from Poland or you know Barcelona and see him like pictures of visiting grandkids, you should remember that he's not posting like the flight delays and the, uh, you know, um, and, and the, uh, you know, struggles with kids or whatever it is. You're just seeing like the highlights. It's like the greatest hits of people. And yet we compare our lives with theirs and theirs is always going to be more glamorous because you're only seeing the glamorous part. Yeah. Um, but just coming back to ChatGPT, it seems it occurred like a tornado or something, and it seems to have surprised even specialists like yourself. And it was a very shocking new, uh, news to me suddenly that Geoff Hinton resigned from Google. Why do you think he did that? Because normally when you are a person who understands what they are doing and you are in a place of power like you are in the development department of Google, you would never resign, but you would say, I will try my best in order to get the things sorted out. Why do you think he resigned? What did he tell his boss and what might you have said in, in, in his place? <laughs> well, I don't know him or his boss and never met either one of them, but, um, and so I, I, I can't really criticize what he did. I don't know his whole story. I, I think I would have been more encouraged if he had stayed at Google and said, we at Google are going to take these actions. And if he took leadership and then used that position to sit down with Microsoft and OpenAI and the other companies, um, but the way, but what he said is the reason he stepped out of Google is so that he could be more free. And when he speaks now, 
you don't have the question of whether he's speaking because of his interest in as an employee of Google or whether Google has has tied his hands on what he can say. Um, I don't know uh, what he said to, to the CEO. Um, I suspect that he probably said a lot of the same things he said to us, but more pointedly and more specifically about things that were happening in Google. He did say that he didn't resign because he thought Google was going in the wrong direction or anything like that. As far as what I would have said, um, I would have said we need to get beyond the summits of photo ops in Washington, D.C. of CEOs talking to Congress or sitting in the White House and actually get together and, and, and make some collaboration between the White House. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm talking sort of U.S.-centric, but could translate that to the EU. But the President of the United States has something called the uh, President's Advisory, uh, it's P, uh, PCAS, President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And they're some of the leading um, CEOs and scientists um, um, on it. And they should be sitting down with the CEOs of Facebook and, and or Meta and um, all these AI companies and, and working some things out together and not just, you know, having public hearings. That... So that's what I would have recommended. I would have recommended, hey, let's, let's pull together on all the people who are involved, but you would also have to get the Chinese on board probably, and maybe other, co I don't know whether there are other players. In I, I mean, I think, sure, it would be ideal if the Chinese were, were on board, but they're not gonna be, and neither are the Russians. And so um, if the issue is competing with China over AI capabilities, I don't see that getting together and talking about guidelines for generative AI introduction into the public is gonna affect our competitiveness with China. Now, if you said the military should stop developing and you should stop developing the technology altogether, then I would say, well, that's a little bit you know, naive because that means we're going to fall behind China in the technology. But I think that's a different sort of issue than um, getting together to figure out how do we roll out consumer products, right? So if we take the lead in consumer product safety, that is a legit lead. Uh, and doesn't put us behind other countries or, techno or other companies on our technology. But that shows that on the one hand, we see there is a need for regulation, like Italy, for example, they, they banned uh, the use of JetGPT, as far as I know. I don't know whether there are other countries who have also banned it. I mean, China has banned it for political reasons. Um, so what do you think, uh, is it possible to regulate the development of artificial intelligence and the use of that? Or do you think there, or what would you advise to a group of politicians? Uh, you have five minutes and uh, you can tell them, policymakers, listen to me. Uh, if you want to have a good future with AI, with ChatGPT and so on, and, and follow up products, do this. What would you say? So I, I, I would encourage them to think about three analogies, reject one and think about the other two. So the one I would reject is nuclear power, nuclear technology nuclear weapons, uh, which is an approach of containment and non-proliferation. And while that has helped us uh, in great ways over the past 60 or 70 years, it's an extremely expensive, uh, as in tens of billions of dollars a year to, to do, and it's already too late for this technology because everyone can get to it. Um, Meta's large language model called Llama leaked out already and so people are using that and building their own version of, of, uh, of these chat models. So that's the wrong model. The, the ones that I think are worth considering are um, electrical safety and biological safety. And I'm not saying we should implement everything about them in this area, but they have similar properties in that there's a sense like you can't buy a piece of electronics to plug into your wall that doesn't have in the United States the UL Underwriter Laboratory safety sticker on it. In Europe, there's a different one, but it's the same principle is that if you're gonna sell something that runs on electricity and plugs into the wall, it's gotta have been tested for safety. So this notion of validating products for safety, I think makes good sense for AI and shouldn't slow us down. And, and even if we're afraid it might slow us down, it behooves us to figure out what those regulations might look like and then later figure out how or whether we enforce them. 
The second analogy would be biosafety. You can't work on the SARS-CoV-2 virus unless you have a, a certain safety level in your laboratory, and that safety level have to, has to be inspected and proved, and, and, and there are procedures that you, you take, and not much different than, you know, uh, my brother used to work at Texas Instruments, and before we went into the room where the, the clean room, they called it, we had to do certain things, um, put on booties, go through this air shower that, and then, ha you know, to, to get in there. So, so the biosafety that says, if you're gonna work on this kind of technology, you have to have these protections in place, I think also has some uh, lessons that we could learn in, in terms of AI regulation. But again, I would say we should separate the what would help part from how do we implement it and not let this, is it practical or not, stop us from at least developing what we think is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, it seems like the train is running already and we can't stop the train. We can only try to, to, to divert the track in the right direction somehow and, and limit its, uh, uh, its way to some degree, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just um, on the train thing, the, the White House did have this meeting with the four companies that are leading in the large models, right? The um, OpenAI, um, Anthropic, uh, face uh, no, um, Microsoft and and, uh, and Google, and they they were asked why they didn't invite Meta, and they said, oh, because they're not doing AI in interfacing with a customer. That's an example of policymakers totally not getting the technology. What they don't get is that the social media like Meta are the delivery mechanism for these technologies, not to mention that Meta is also doing AI. So I, I took that as a kind of a danger signal that we're still not quite getting it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think probably the next time they will invite Meta. But. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the other thing that I feel is we, uh, as we see the power of AI, we want to use it to the maximum. Um, for example, when it comes to transportation systems like autonomously driving cars. What do you think about that? Should we allow AI to make autonomous decisions that have an effect on our biological safety, so to say, when you sit in such a car? And it seems to work in, in many cases, but at the same time, when I refer back to your vision recognition system, which has an error rate of still 8% or something like that, how reliable is it to, to have yourself driven in an autonomously driving car? Would you, would you uh, enter such a car? And <laughs> um, well, we're, we're, we're not there yet, uh, uh, despite what people who have a financial interest in selling those cars will say, we're not there. Um, but there are things about these, there are these levels of autonomy in vehicles, and we already have some that have absolutely saved lives. The, um, the automatic emergency braking system, um, this is, you know, my wife has this in her car, and she said one time uh, somebody cut her off, and before she could even get her foot on the brake, the car was starting to brake. Uh, so. Um, those kind of things are already happening. A fully autonomous self-driving car, I think, is realistic. I, um, I think that it's like any other AI system. I think that perfection is probably not the, the right target. But uh, if we're going for safety, then we want the, the autonomous vehicle to drive better than a really good driver, which is still not perfect. Um, so... Yeah, so would I get into an autonomous vehicle that drives itself? Um, I wouldn't take my eye off the road uh, or give up control. Um, and it would probably, I would be more likely to do it in, um, in the Chicago Loop downtown where the maximum speed limit is 30 miles an hour than I would out in the suburbs where people are going 60 miles an hour. That's very similar to what I've heard Mercedes-Benz uh, is guaranteeing for their cars. They say they take responsibility if you don't, if you only use autonomously driving uh, on, on highways and not going beyond 60 kilometers per hour. And so in very clear settings, 
Yeah. But not uh, in the countryside where streets can look very, uh, can, uh, can exhibit very unexpected uh, yeah. hindrances. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I have several friends who have these, these cars um, and they are pretty comfortable on the highway where there are very, you know, constrained interactions and few, uh, most of the time, few, few un unusual things. But even then, they said it, uh, one of my friends said it can get confused when there's road construction and uh, the lines that are painted on the road don't match what the road construction barriers are telling you. So it shows that we are still dealing with specific intelligence or weak intelligence and not yet general intelligence, which actually understands what it is doing, but it's just comparing patterns. And as far as that is the case, we can only use it for very specific circumstances, really, yeah? Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. And then where there are times when we're driving that people have to make judgment calls, um, the, the, we're pretty far away from, from that. Although I have to say, I think it's, you know, there are these scenarios that people come up with, with like, like, do I plow into this person with this pushing a baby carriage or do I plow in to the back of this car? And while that's important, that's a rarity. Those are sort of edge cases with driving. And if you're in a situation where you have to make that choice, then you probably shouldn't be using an autonomous vehicle. Okay, let's uh, just, uh, before we open up for questions from the audience, um, a Christian view on that, because when you talk to Christians, they have very opposite views often. I know some Christians who would say that chat GPT and artificial intelligence, this is the new letterpress revolution. It's a new way of distributing information, including the gospel, Christian apologetics, and so on. So it's, it's opening up a whole new world of possibilities to spread the gospel, uh, because it's a new world with free access to and sharing of information. And we see it happening to some degree, yeah, with ChatGPT. Some of the sermons of ChatGPT are better than those delivered by some pastors, I would say. Um, and others, on the other hand, say that the internet and artificial intelligence are the bridgehead into the book of Revelation of a totalitarian supervision where only people with certain devices can partake in trade and social life and so on. And we also see that happening when we look to China, for example. But even to some instances in Western culture as well, you can only deal uh, uh, um, in certain ways when you are connected, have a certain account with some company and so on. Um, so what is your perspective as a Christian? Which picture do you attend more or do you think it's a mixed picture? And what is our possibility as Christians to interfere with that and to influence the future development of that? Well, I, you know, I think there's a little bit of both things happening. Um, so I wouldn't discount any of those those views completely. Um, I, I think just to take the dystopian one first, um, I think we have some. I think we have some reason to 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 really, and this is not a new thing. Be mindful of the intentions, the character, um, the values of the leaders that we elect. When we in countries where we have that privilege and to exercise that privilege and think less about um, do I agree do I agree with this person on all these things because you'll never find somebody that you agree with on all these things and so you really have to go with the, the person and the character and um, what I see in the tech world in particular is this growing um, movement over the past few decades, uh, sort of a combination of ultra wealth, even not, I'm not talking about just the 1%, but ultra wealth uh, in, in, in the tech industry and then everyone else that's, you know, people that are making five times as much as everyone else. And the in, inside that culture um, is a focus on technology and in being enamored with technology um, and, and, and along with that, as we all have the hope of eternal life, their hope of eternal life is to be augmented by technology and eventually be able to upload themselves uh, uh, into uh, you know, the, the writings of Ray Kurzweil and, and, and the singularity. So the, the concern I have is that that philosophy, that long-termism is, is one of those philosophies, uh, 
it, as it makes its way into governments, um, it will have influence that we would prefer not to have. And that's where the character of the leaders is important because we can't anticipate that. So character, character, character. Um, and then at the very high end, you, you see the people who are on the boards of directors of these companies or CEOs of these companies who are wealthy enough to be shielded from the consequences of of, of their actions. Um, I just saw this morning a picture of Jeff Bezos' new $500 million yacht. Um, if, if the United States goes to heck in a handbasket, he's going to be okay. He'll go to his island, he'll live on his yacht, right? Um, Peter Thiel, another one of these leaders um, uh, in, in technology, has made a lot of money. He doesn't really have the same stake in how things go in, in the U.S. because he's moved to New Zealand and applied for citizenship there. So, so these people that are in very high influence, it's, it's important to sort of watch what, what they're doing and have some caution. And I think it's the fear of that that causes people to be afraid of the ushering in of, of you know, the, the mark on the forehead and, and all that. So then on the other side, I think there's way more reason um, for for hope and, and, and embracing and trying to influence where AI goes in both the, the gospel and in just uh, how we live as people. And so when, when my father died six, uh, almost six years ago, one of the first things I did was I bought my mom a Amazon uh, Alexa with a screen because I wanted, and then we we got the smaller hockey puck ones for all the grandkids and we had them because I wanted everyone to be able to connect with my mom as easy as, as they could because she was going to be alone. And it, it turns out that she, she sort of considers Alexa her friend. And my mom is very tech savvy, so she knows it's just an algorithm, but she just kind of gets a kick out of it and she'll say goodnight to Alexa. She doesn't anthropomorphize her or anything. It's a game for her. She likes that Alexa tells her, you know, it's time to go out. Uh, t trash, is, trash day is tomorrow. I'll take the trash out. Uh, she tells Alexa, thank you. She likes that she can go to bed and she can say, Alexa, turn all the lights off, you know. So I think, you know, we're, we're entering a time when our, our parents are aging, we're aging. And I think AI has such tremendous potential to make that uh, easier. Uh, for people in much more fundamental ways than just my mom's, you know, uh, device. Although that's really, you know, she, because of her device, it turned out like she had her brother buy one and then her sister was in her 90s bought one and they, they talk to each other all the time. So um, other technology that we're seeing, we're starting to see technology for assisted living. Um, uh, imagine if you, if you had uh, the ability to put a certain kind of carpet in your house that understood your gate, that just, you know, just sensors in it and some machine learning program that just understood your gate and could, could say, hey, something's different. You're limping or you, you stumbled there and, and could alert you or even your, your, your children that, that something might be, might be going on. More than just I fall and I can't get up, that's of course useful too. But to be able to use AI to predict or anticipate like we do on airplanes, you know, if, if a weird vibration happens on your Boeing 787, by the time it lands in the airport, there's probably a replacement part there from Boeing. So, so, so this anticipation um, would be tremendously helpful because when you're aging, uh, taking a fall, breaking a hip, uh, is oftentimes the the trigger that you know causes accelerates your your, your death. Robotic surgery is another area. Uh, we have a and then we have a group at the University of Illinois in Chicago that is doing robotic surgery. We have a group at Argonne that's taken their uh, deep learning algorithms uh, in genetics to to begin to develop capabilities to forecast pathogens, starting with a variant of SARS-CoV-2, and then uh, use self-driving laboratories and machine learning to design a drug that would dock with that, that pathogen. So we can imagine with AI very quickly that we could go from an 18 month cycle to get a vaccine like with COVID-19, which was already amazing, we quick, um, to an 18 week or even an 18 day cycle. 
And that will only happen with AI. So these are like, just in the medical area alone, exciting uh, things uh, that we can, we can think about. In the gospel, uh, uh, our, our friends Pete and Beth, another couple in, in Chicago, were just this week in, in uh, um, Bangkok, Thailand at a semi-secret uh, evangelical conference of, of groups that are getting the gospel out into um, places that are not open to the gospel, like um, an electronic device that looks like a kitchen timer but also has the entire Bible on it, uh, or another device that looks like a Wi-Fi hotspot, but when you connect to it, you can download the Jesus film. So. Um, he, we've been chatting this week or last week when he, they were there, and he's been telling me some of the things that these groups are looking at AI to do, like the Wycliffe, Wycliffe uh, people are saying, hey, we could really accelerate the way that we translate the Bible. Um, you can, with GPT-4, you could, in your prompt, you could include a grammar and a vocabulary and some sample text of a language and ask that to translate this passage of the Bible or this book, and then have an expert who knows the language correct it, uh, and that would be a, a boon. A, a, another area in terms of the gospel that I think is less straightforward uh, and needs to be thought through is to what degree would we want to use a tr specially trained and prompted AI uh, to allow people to query about the gospel, to explore, to be seekers with an AI before they're comfortable talking to a human. And you know, there's a slippery slope somewhere in there, uh, but, but I think it's at least interesting to think about these different ways we can use AI. Uh, like an AI apologist who- Yeah, I mean, you, you can already with these models, you can say, <laughs> I want you to tell me about this, but I want you to tell me from the perspective of a Presbyterian pastor or, you know, a you know, nuclear physicist or whatever. So, mm -hmm. so these models have the capability of adjusting the, the, uh, the response from a particular point of view, which is pretty amazing, by the way, for a piece of math. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, a final personal question. In, in your all, all of your career, uh, you've been a Christian. And uh, were there some situations where you would say, my Christian faith really was very important to keep up my motivation to my work, or my Christian faith was important because I realized, stop, there is a place I should not go in my research and in my work. How, how did your Christian faith play into your work um, ethics? So, yeah, so I don't think that I've ever done, well, I was going to say, I don't think I've done research in areas where there were ethics involved, but, but that's not, not really true. So we've done these projects in primarily in Chicago, but other cities too, where we're putting cameras out there with, with AI embedded with the camera. And I, I think that um, my sense of um, uh, working with individuals and communities influenced the way that project went in the, a couple of ways. One, we designed from the ground up, the architecture of these devices and the policies with which they run to be not just secure from a cybersecurity point of view, but to protect against their use for surveillance. Um, even uh, early on with, uh, the, uh, with some things that we built in, like uh, with our, our privacy policies, we couldn't really say that we would tell people if we got some legal authority that told us to use these for, for, um, for surveillance, but we, we, we thought that was important, that kind of transparency, even if we were going to be prevented. By the way, it never happened, and this has now been 10 years. But what we said was every year when we put out our annual report, we're going to have a statement that says we've not been asked by any legal authority to give information out. And if that statement's ever missing, then that's your, that's your clue. So um, that whole uh, privacy uh, protection, I think, comes from myself and also the person I talked about that, that's in, that was in Bangkok, another believer that, we, that I work with. Uh, I think that influenced. The other place that influenced our approach was we felt it was important if we we're going to put one of these devices in your neighborhood that you were not just okay with it, but you, you could see that it was valuable. And so we 
we had community meetings and, um, and made sure that before we placed these devices in someone's neighborhood, that we were aligned with them on something like they were concerned about air pollution or traffic safety, and that they would see our device as something that we, we you know, the big brother thing was always the thing that came up and we said, no, no, this is not the city watching you, this is you watching the city, you being able to advocate for air pollution in your neighborhood with actual data rather than just anecdotes. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in the more personal sense, my Christian belief um, has caused me to think very carefully about my relationships with other people. And I wouldn't say in 40 years that there's nobody out there who would say that he's a bad guy. Um, not because I am a bad guy, but because everyone has a different perspective. And but sometimes I make mistakes. But somebody told me early on, it's funny, but I don't think it's true, that they said um, in my, early on in my career, they said, just remember, friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. <laughs> so I, I, um, so I, I think that I... I don't think that's true. Um, and in fact, I've, take, I've tried to, to, to do just the opposite, which is to say, I want my friends to accumulate. And so I have built relationships with people from all walks of life, um, uh, all beliefs, uh, gay people, straight people, people who are confused about their gender. I, I feel like my role is to love them and to build a level of trust with them that gives me the right to talk about the gospel. And until I have that trust with them, I, I'm not saying for anyone else, but I'm saying I don't feel I have the right to, to tell you the gospel until there's some trust. And I, I'm, that's not a categorical. If I meet somebody on the bus and they say, how must I be saved? I, don't, I won't say, well, let's have dinner first, you know, but, um, but for the most part, you know, um, and, and that's kind of in contrast to a lot of us that, that have been in evangelical Christians for, for a long time with this legitimate and good passion to reach the world with the gospel. We have a sometimes been uh, in error, I think, seeing relationships as I'm going to build in this relationship with the goal of getting them into my church. And if it doesn't look like it's going to go that way, I'll find somebody else that's closer and I, I haven't taken that approach. I've, I've taken that approach that says, you know, um, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, Paul's 80th birthday party in in a month. Paul's not a Christian, but I've worked with Paul for almost four years. He knows that I'm a believer. Um, we've actually had conversations, but he's not a believer. And I feel like the, the relationship I've built with him, when he's at a point where the Holy Spirit has prepared his heart, he knows that there are a couple of people he can talk to and trust, and I'm one of those people. I'm going to another 80th birthday party for a guy named Vint this, uh, this, this fall, uh, same situation, only he and I have, I have had very deep conversations, and I've worked with him. He's actually been a mentor of mine since the early 90s, and, and we've had conversations where he's asked me, like, how do you reconcile, when I say, oh, I'm playing drums at church this weekend, how do you reconcile your faith with your, with your being a scientist? And, and he's not a believer either, but he knows because we have this relationship that um, I'm a person he can talk to about that. So I... I guess, you know, I've sort of, I, I don't know if it's the right way for everyone, but I've tried to build lifelong relationships with people um, and, and pray that those give opportunity for the gospel. That's always two ways. On the one hand, every workplace is a place of relationships and where you meet people, real people, uh, to whom you want to just show the character of Christ and have a, develop a good relationship. And the other thing is, think about what am I doing and how does the gospel affect what I'm doing actually.